So welcome to the uh, session on big data for health governance. So uh, I'm Ross Koppel. Um, I'll be uh, chairing and moderating this session. So we have seen through the World Health Summit that uh, the coming of competent IT systems to healthcare is a huge area of interest and concern. Yesterday we had um, artificial a session on artificial intelligence, on precision medicine. We're going to be talking about big data, particularly how it fits into uh, a health system. And uh, later today we're going to uh, have a session on digital health. And they're all interlocking aspects of the same uh, set of concerns. So uh, we've got a number of speakers who I'll introduce in a moment but just make a couple of remarks. First of all, I'd like to thank the organisers for putting, for inviting us all and putting this session together. And um, I think probably say, you know, big data, we're going to have our various speakers come in tangentially to different parts of this and give you their definition of big data. And surprisingly, there's not a clear definition of big data. Generally, it's thought of as more data than you currently have and data that you can't work with very well. But I think we can probably say it's characterised by a very large amount of data. It's characterised by unstructured data from many sources so that uh, a well-defined relational database, even with lots and lots of patient records, isn't really big data because you have control of it. But when you have unstructured data of very many different types, then you're working with big data and your data sources are growing all the time. So this, we all feel that somewhere in the big data is information that's going to help us deliver better care. And I think some of the questions we're going to be passing across in this session are, well, where's the workforce? Where are the data analysts that we can afford to employ within the health system? How do we actually get, um, how do we actually afford to take big data? What's, what conclusions from big data are worth knowing about because they're actually actionable within the health system you run. And what, is, what do we do about this tension between uh, personal information, the public good, and commercial interest in exploiting that information? So a number of these issues will be covered. We hope to, we'll have presentations from each of the, uh, of the uh, panel members and we hope to keep that relatively short so that we can then have some discussion and questions from the audience. So I'd just like to introduce uh, the pan uh, panel. So uh, Ola Rosling from the Gapminder Foundation, uh, Maxim Fedorov from the... Come on up, take a seat. <laughs> up there. From the uh, Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology, uh, in the center, he's in the Centre for Computational Data Intensive Science and Engineering. Uh, we have David Delaney from SAP, uh, who, where he's the Chief Medical Officer in the United States Division of that organisation. Uh, Francesca, Francesco Colombo from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, where she's Head of the Health Division. And Albaina Koyumjeva from the European Commission and the Director General of Research and uh, Innovation, and she's a program manager there. Thanks very much. So we're going to kick it off uh, with uh, Ola, and I'll give you a bit of a time. One, two, one, two. Yes, there is my voice. Uh, so big data. Let me, let me start by introducing myself. I am not opening the right, uh, I should be opening my own uh, presentation. That's, that's the one. Okay, data. Uh, first of all, my name is Ola Rosling. I'm the son and the former chief of my father, Hans Rosling, who passed away in February. Since 18 years, uh, we have together been fighting devastating ignorance about the world. Uh, so my father dropped out of Karolinska Institute in Stockholm to instead become a YouTuber. Uh, he got so popular on TED by describing the world through data 
that we ended up selling our software to Google, and I worked uh, at their headquarters for three years, where I started the, the Google Public Data Search, which enables people to find statistics, uh, public statistics, not really big data, but uh, official numbers easily on Google by searching and uh, pointing them to the best data source. Then I dropped out of Google because I realized that people don't search for data. Instead, they look for confirmation about their false worldview. So we went back to Gapminder Foundation, which is an uh, independent nonprofit, uh, and developed teaching materials. So everything I'm showing you now is going to be part of our teaching materials, which is for the public in general, but also for decision makers. The whole idea with data is to be able to predict the future in some way or another. Data must be turned into information, information into knowledge, and if knowledge, well, we know things, but the wisdom to do the right thing is the actual intention with all data collection, I would say. So the whole idea of big data is that evidence will now make us uh, do the right things. The question is, will big data result in big health improvements? So what is a big health improvement? Um, let's look at this question. I hope that some of you uh, had the time to answer my fact questions. How many of the world's one-year-old children have been vaccinated with some vaccine? Okay, usually it's measles, but it might be something else. The correct answer is 80% out of ABC here. The real number is actually 88. I rounded it downwards to be sure that I'm on the lower end of uncertainty. And uh, we asked this question in 12 countries to the public. And here are the results from the very highly educated Swedish public. 21% scored correct. They picked the 80%. The, uh, the other countries here, you can see they are worse than Sweden. And it's basically because Sweden is where my father has been living for 20 years, and we've been informing the public about the state of the world. There is one sub-population uh, in Sweden at the zoo called monkeys, and we went there with bananas, and we said A, B, or C, 80, 50, 20% children vaccinated. And to our great surprise, 33% of them picked the right answer. Way better than the public in all the countries where we've been polling this. Okay. So the public is not only ignorant in terms of guessing randomly, no, they score worse than random. How can humans score worse than random when it comes to global development? Because they have preconceived ideas. We call them mega misconceptions. We went to the conference for the news reporters at the Euro News Conference in, in uh, Morocco. They scored worse than the public in every country we've been polling, the journalists. So we cannot blame the journalists for giving a false worldview because they don't know what they are doing. They're equally bad or worse than the public. They look at all the catastrophic news, 94% of them pick the other answer. And the difference between A, B, and C is 80, 50, 20. It's a huge difference. It's not in the decimals, right? So they believe that the minority of children are vaccinated. Well, the, the real number is the majority are vaccinated, right? That's the difference. The factual filmmakers of Discovery Channel, National Geographic, are not better than the US public, okay? I've been at two conferences testing the audience, and now let's see this audience in this group in this room. Here are your results. Okay, 22% of the audience in this eminent room pick the right answer. The rest of you believe that half of the children, or maybe 20%, are vaccinated. You are roughly 30 or 50 years behind global development. The world has changed. You didn't see it in the news, and you didn't see it in the data tables where you were watching. So the question is, how do we get our worldview? Uh, Immunization has changed like this since 1980. It's a great public health success, right? And most health improvements come from prevention. Okay, it's not the acts of doctors in hospitals. Most health improvements are from prevention. We ask this also to very uh, other groups like the World Economic Forum and at, at Cornell University. You see the extremely wrong answer, 20% children are vaccinated, is the, what the majority of highly educated pick. They have no idea about the success story in the world. Let me just point out one of the big five banks in the world who's going out to invest the big money in this world. 4% of them picked the right answer. They have an absolutely upside-down worldview. At the World Economic Forum, my father was on stage and he asked the experts who are going to give the lectures, and 18% picked the right answer. Is data turning into wisdom? No. No, not by default. We have to do a lot of education and a lot of thinking and a lot of questioning of our preconceived ideas. We went to the Nobel laureates yearly meeting in Lindau when they sit down with the best medical researchers in the world and discuss medical research. And they scored worse than everyone else. No, not really. Not as the bankers. 
but way worse than the US public, because the US public is more like chimpanzees, right? They pick an answer. These experts, they know about health problems, so the problem improve, increase in their heads. And this is the challenge with data. Are we asking the right questions if we have the false worldview to begin with, right? The Westerners in general with high status jobs have a completely distorted worldview. Okay, let's, let's look at this audience's results. Uh, it's a very fun job. Uh, uh, sorry, this is another question. Uh, sorry, no, that was the vaccination question. Let's move on. Uh, so what has happened in the world? I'm going to speed up, okay, because soon you're going to interrupt me. Let me just show you this graph showing all the countries in the world. Uh, the idea of the majority not being vaccinated, not having access to health care, is because you think the m many people live in developing countries and there has been no improvement. That's absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Look at the world. There are not two kinds of countries at all. There are the richest up in the corner, all of the countries like US, etc., and European Union are here, but soon to follow are, you see, Portugal, Turkey, Algeria, China, the big bubbles are uh, the population, so it's uh, India would be this one, right? And they are very high in income. So this is like a world map. You see the rich, the rich and poor, and the healthy and sick, because that's life expectancy. There's a strong correlation between money and life, the long life you get. At the same time, you can, you can show this to the health minister and the finance minister will also understand that South Africa is down there, but Peru is up there. How can they be on the same income level but have a difference in 20 years of, of uh, life expectancy? Maybe it's because the Peruvians are using big data better. You think so? No. It's a better healthcare system. They do the right thing and they didn't get the HIV in the same extent. But this kind of visualizations of data might turn it into wisdom. Let's go back 200 years in time and confront the other misconception. The idea that the world is getting worse. 200 years ago the world looked like this. There was not one single country on the health levels where the poorest are today. Not one. We have to zoom out to even see one country in the year 1800. There they are. 30 years of life expectancy. I would have been dead for 11 years already. Okay? Since then, the world has changed, and if you want to clap your hands, this is the moment. Because we have gotten richer and healthier all over the spectra. Up to the Second World War, uh, you can see the Spanish flu here. I'm doing the fast version, right? These tools are freely available on our website for education. So here's the Spanish flu. Look at this life expectancy. And then back on track again. Let's move forward. You can see the rich colonial power saying we're better than everyone else because we were ahead of everyone else, right? Second World War. Going back like this, oh, we, we could select, uh, that, that would be Germany, for example. We can select Germany, um, because we are in Germany. Uh, and we can see what they did during the Second World War. They went down like this, east and west jointly, and then back on track again, back up to the rest of the world. But look where, look where Germany was after the Second World War. Let's, let's point trails like this and see what has happened after the world since UN was, uh, was created. The world has changed like this, see. There are no countries left in the corner. And this, these African countries like Ghana and Pakistan and, and Sudan, they are now where Germany was after the Second World War. And Sweden was there as well, and South Korea started there. The enormous change, the majority of the world is on a higher income level and life expectancy level than Germany was after the Second World War. Okay? And then you catch up if you got the right education in people's head. Because how, how can you uh, improve lives. What is a big health difference? There are not two different worlds any longer. There was a divided world, but we don't have that anymore. The majority are in the middle. If we look at, at the, uh, the global burden of disease, globally, we can see it if we simplify it, you know, from the EMA Institute. 61% uh, today of the burden of disease is non-communicable diseases. Lifelong uh, illness and, and treatment is needed. Communicable diseases are on only 28% of the world global burden of disease like, like uh, measles and, and stuff like that. But the vaccinations have removed measles almost everywhere. So there are a few viruses and bacteria still killing a lot of people. The richest though, the same, the same uh, uh, burden of disease diagram, it's only, almost only non-communicable diseases that, that is a burden in the richest billion people. And then we have the poorest, where the picture is the opposite, where it's almost only communicable diseases which cause the burden, okay? So there is a divided world in this sense, but then we forgot about the five billion people in between, okay? So if we look to replace the developing countries and developed, we need levels, right? Like in Pokemon, you know, you start on level one, then level two, level three, level, you develop over, you shouldn't label a country. 
because countries move just like Germany did. It's no longer a developing country as it was after the Second World War. No, it has changed. These people in the middle, the five billion, the customers, right? Those who, who start earning more and more money. They, they are suffering from non-communicable diseases as a, at an increasing rate as they get richer. So right now you've got already two billion people who cannot afford the, the lifelong treatment. Will big data make this health improvement for them? I don't think so. Okay? <laughs> Very unlikely. Let's move on. The world is not getting worse. The life expectancy answer to this question, uh, let's, let's skip that one and move faster because uh, I just want to say that the evidence to do the right healthcare is not what saves the life because we already know what to do. We need to put girls in school, we need to give them clean water and good sanitation. That will boost the life expectancy and the disability adjusted life years in the future as it did in the past. But people don't realize that, that education has come a, a long way already. When we ask of, of the average schooling of women, for example, this is a terrible result. In Sweden, 18% know that women have nine years of schooling while men have 10. They think the women are behind. No, the world has changed. In this audience, in this room, let's see what you answered. That was the life expectancy. You were worse on chimpanzees on life expectancy question. How is that even possible? That's my <laughs> main question. And when it comes to women's education, you, you feel bad for all the girls who don't go to school, right? So you pick the six years is probably the, the women's average. No, it's nine. Women have almost catched up, and that gives us hope. We can bring it to 10, so it's equal to men, right? Because we're almost there. We're doing the right thing across the world. So people lose hope. They think the world is getting worse. It's not. It's a pretty good world, right? Let me, let me skip a few slides here. I just want to, to show you, a l just to sum up what we're doing. We're, we're identifying not the big data, but the small data, the official data, and we check if people know it. And where there is a huge discrepancy between reliable data and people's knowledge, that's the work of my foundation. And it's really fun because I can run around and tell people, this is the pin code of the world. This is where people live, 1114. Not the detailed map, but the big rounded numbers that people get wrong. People put a billion people on the wrong continent when we ask this question. So my, my, my input in this big data discussion will all be about if we have failed to see the big picture, how are we going to do the right decisions based on fragmented small social media uh, uh, data and that kind of evidence when we fail already to turn the good data that we have into understanding of the world? Just to finish this question, like official numbers from UN about the projection of demography. Two billion children are between age zero and 15 in the world today. How many will there be in the future? We ask this question across the world and, and people uh, pick the wrong answer. Let's pick this audience answer and then I'm just going to uh, give you, explain, yeah. Oh, this is terrible results, I'm sorry to tell you. you. I'm not questioning your intelligence at all. Please dissociate knowledge and intelligence. Okay, factual knowledge about official UN estimates has nothing to do with intelligence. Did you hear this number or not? You think in this audience, like everyone else I've been asking, that the projection says 4 billion children in the future because you know the population will keep growing, right? So the number of children must be growing. That's the only way the population can grow. It's very intuitive. No, it's absolutely wrong. The right answer is 2 billion children in the future, but almost nobody knows it, except for the chimpanzees, of course. My father asked it at the World Economic Forum and people don't know it. It's the key figure in sustainability development discussion. It's not big data. It's small data official number. How can this be? Well, the number of children per woman dropped like this since 1965 because across cultures, religions, continent, we talk about sex, okay? And we plan parenthood. 90% of humanity already have the contraceptives they need and the other 10% need it too. Let me, let me show you the, the projection and then I'm done. Yeah, please, please stand there a little bit longer. Yes, okay. <laughs> this is what the UN expect. The, healthcare, uh, the, the family planning change has already happened and with two billion children in the future. But if nobody learns about the data, the data doesn't have any impact on decision making and evidence. And that I'd say is the biggest challenge for, for uh, uh, big data as well. The reason for population growth is this one. You see, we're filling up the age floors in the population pyramid and turning the pyramid into a rectangle without the base increasing at all. That will add three billion growing ups and then one billion old people. So it's not a lot of old people, it's one billion old people. The other ones are just like me, middle-aged, okay? These misconceptions make us ask the wrong questions. 
And that's the biggest challenge when we're about to turn data into wisdom, that we're asking and looking for the wrong things. In a world where the majority are in the middle, the problem is they can't afford the non-communicable treatment they need. Thank you very much. So, Ola, thank you for, uh, for that, uh, I think, uh, global view of big data and just truth and information at the very highest level. I think we're now going to move down into uh, issues more related to collection of big data, big data in healthcare systems, and uh, how, we, how we cope with them. So, the next speaker is Maxine Federoff. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I represent the Skolkov Institute of Science and Technology located uh, nearby Moscow. Uh, it's a new international uh, technological university in the <coughs> heart of Russia. Uh, well, I spent uh, 14 years outside of Russia while uh, building supercomputer systems, uh, applying supercomputer and big data technologies uh, uh, to different problems, including uh, healthcare related uh, problems. Uh, so, my last post was director of supercomputer. Uh, center in uh, Glasgow, and then I moved uh, to Skoltech as a director of uh, uh, <coughs> computational and dental intensive science and junior. Uh, right, well, let's start with some definitions because uh, I'm working together with mathematicians and they uh, like definitions. Uh, so, what is health? According to the <coughs> Uh, World Health Organization, health is a state of complete uh, physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Well, what is big data? Uh, as was discussed already uh, many, uh, many times uh, on these premises, well, there are many definitions of big data. Well, person, I prefer the definition uh, uh, given by <coughs> Gartner uh, and slightly modified in this uh, uh, very nice uh, paper. Uh, evaluating well different definitions of big data. So big data is the information asset characterized by uh, uh, such a high volume, so that means well large amount of data velocity. That means well uh, quick changes. Uh, ideally, we prefer to work with uh, data sets well that uh, uh, <coughs> uh, which reflect well the real time changes, uh, the and variety. As was discussed, it means that well we have collections of. Uh, highly unstructured data, uh, data of uh, different nature, uh, uh, well, digital, uh, non-digital data like, well, speeches, uh, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, <coughs> this asset is to require specific technology and analytical methods uh, for its transformation into value. Okay, so if uh, our target, our value is health, so that means that we come to a definition that, well, big health is specific technology and analytical methods of big data designed for improving health of a population, right? So, so therefore, uh, we are talking about, well, technologies that uh, use uh, big data and uh, which have a massive impact on uh, large scale on population, <coughs> populations. And uh, in the previous talk, we saw that, well, indeed, well, there are uh, massive impacts of uh, 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 large-scale he uh, healthcare uh, techniques on uh, populations in the world. Right. Uh, who is in? Well, the market. Uh, well, uh, the market of big data-related technologies in the healthcare is estimated as trillions overall uh, the world, and uh, all large IT companies like Google, IBM, Apple, uh, Oracle, etc., are already there. Well. The <coughs> You, you may have seen uh, this uh, in the news that, well, there are many uh, uh, interesting uh, technologies uh, uh, <coughs> that, was, uh, uh, that were released recently by Google and IBM. And these technologies are primarily used for uh, preventing medical errors. Uh, uh, so that means, well, uh, second opinion, for instance, well, different diagnostic techniques, identifying high-risk uh, patients, reducing hospital costs um, and waiting times while well, preventing security breaches and fraud and uh, uh, several other applications. Right. So does it mean that everything is done? Well, Google is there, right? I IBM is there. So, uh, and well, 
shall we just relax and enjoy all, 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 all these uh, positive consequences of uh, big data technologies and healthcare? So, in fact, uh, not really. Although, well, there have been a great progress recently. Well, and this is because there is a number of barriers, and uh, in the next several minutes, uh, I will talk about uh, 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 some ideas how to overcome these barriers. Ethics, right, uh, regulations, finances, uh, <coughs> because, well, uh, many of these technologies are, are quite expensive. Well, technologies themselves, uh, because uh, as we discussed, uh, uh, for instance, uh, big data in uh, healthcare means uh, lots of unstructured data, so not simple uh, uh, large relation databases. Uh, so we have collections of uh, <coughs> of data, like movies, for instance, like uh, uh, or, uh, qualitative estimations of uh, one's health. Well, better or worse, right? How to convert it in, into digits? It's it's not an easy task. And education, again, well, the previous talk shown us that, well, uh, <coughs> we need, well, proper education of both, well, experts and uh, uh, masses. How can we overcome these barriers? Well, first of all, uh, let me focus on um, the structure of data, because in the last 20 years, the range of semantics and data that need to be shared uh, to enable distributed e-health is far wider than can be accommodated by specific solutions like relational database that capture specific sets of data. So, uh, so now, well, uh, uh, well, those solutions which just screened over database tablets or, or uh, <coughs> other uh, relational database uh, tablets. Well, they, they're, they're not relevant for, big, uh, they, for really big issues in healthcare. And uh, because we need to uh, merge the knowledge of people who understand the semantics of the domain and are not IT people, right? So we need to extract knowledge from uh, doctors. We need to extract knowledge from patients, well, the, the, which is the worst uh, bit here, right? Because, well, we, <coughs> we need to extract knowledge from patients about how, uh, how they're feeling. Uh, what happened before while well, they came to the doctor, and so on and so forth, right? And, uh, um, and we need to merge this information uh, uh, with uh, the expertise of IT professionals uh, uh, whom I represent, actually, right? Because, well, uh, I don't have medical training, although well, uh, my diploma was in medical physics. And uh, uh, how can we overcome it? Well, there are interesting technologies uh, <coughs> these days, and they are all related with uh, uh, development archetypes libraries, right? So, so instead of working with uh, uh, well-defined uh, concepts and well-defined ontology, we work with uh, archetypes which are uh, using uh, recent developments of so-called fuzzy logic, right? So, so it's, it's basically a conversion of this uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, widely defined, well, general knowledge, widely defined uh, uh, explanations of a patient, how uh, he or she felt, uh, well, uh, a month ago, a day ago, etc. Et so, and it can be done now with use of uh, uh, new deep learning and machine learning techniques and uh, recent developments in, uh, <coughs> in high dimensional statistics. So, uh, basically the idea is to recycle, to recycle those technologies that uh, uh, they've uh, been developed already in more technical domains, right? And I will show you a few examples uh, in healthcare, right? Because there are amazing, uh, amazing things uh, that were done uh, for uh, <coughs> non-medical tasks, like uh, archetype model language. So it was developed for uh, actual design of uh, uh, modern uh, chips and uh, for design of uh, <coughs> modern uh, large infrastructure systems. So and uh, it can be applied in uh, medical domains. Yes. And another trick is to uh, hybridize traditional methods, well, that are based on theory and experiments, with uh, modern me uh, methods that uh, yeah, uh, that use uh, data-driven and uh, <coughs> mathematical mo mod uh, model-driven techniques. 
and just a couple examples how it can work. So, brain computer interface, uh, which employs well uh, the most recent developments in sensors and uh, machine learning techniques for uh, <coughs> actually uh, setting up a real brain computer interface. So, so that means that there is no variable explanation anymore, right? So, so the data from uh, the patient's brain can uh, go directly into computer, and that uh, <coughs> gets rid of this uh, filter. Uh, between the uh, actual feeling of the patient, a uh, verbal explanation of these feelings, right? Well, it aches here, right? So what does it mean? What is the nature of this ache, right? So what is the nature of this pain, right? The brain knows better than uh, the patient themselves in a sense, right? So that means that uh, how about getting rid of this uh, <coughs> intermediate here? and just uh, load directly uh, data from brain into a uh, computer. And it can be done with uh, uh, modern techniques. And well, there is a, uh, already a prototype uh, developed in Japan, and now we are developing another uh, prototype, uh, prototype uh, in uh, uh, Skoltech. So now, uh, we have very uh, good techniques for predictive uh, uh, maintenance of uh, sophisticated engineering systems like turbines, jets, etc. They can be applied for clinical diagnostics too, right? So because, uh, well, in a sense, well, human uh, organisms can be considered as a highly sophisticated uh, system and we can apply, it, uh, we can apply uh, our, our data analytics tools here. And, okay, computer vision, of course, and one interesting technique I just wanted to show you is uh, application of uh, three-dimensional image recognition for understanding anatomy of, uh, um, anatomy of uh, human body. So now I would like to stop here. So recycling, recycling of uh, So look, I think you can see we're, we're moving through different aspects uh, of big data. We now have, have had a, a more technical talk around the tools of big data. Uh, I think one of the key things we're starting to see is this one of the tensions in big data is between the personal and the collective and uh, information that we're collecting in one person pooled and utilised and what's extracted out of that does it come back to bring individual benefit. So now we're moving on to David Delaney. Great. Well, thank you, Ross. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is David Delaney, and I serve as Chief Medical Officer at SAP. And um, I also spent over 14 years as a critical care physician, taking care of the sickest of the sick patients at a Boston teaching hospital. And during that time, one of the most surprising things, um, continued to surprise me, was even though it's the most data-rich environment in the entire hospital, the processes for turning that data into insight were incredibly primitive. In fact, we pretty much relied on just going through, wading through the data streams that we had from the monitoring systems, the ventilators, the labs, imaging, trying to get data from outside hospitals when we could, and then sit down and apply our experience to try to make sense and pattern recognize on it and treat these very sick and vulnerable patients. Now, you'd think electronic health records would have changed it all, and they, in fact, did make it easier to grab the data and to do the data um, collection work, but they didn't materially change the fact that we were still on our own. And as the first presentation highlighted, even very intelligent people, if you have the wrong perspective, can make the same mistake over and over, absent feedback. So that the lack of the feedback loop from the data to the clinician to understand how his or her treatment was impacting leads to a lot of challenges. And when you look at healthcare and how it's distributed, there's a huge amount of variation in the cost and quality of healthcare. And there's a couple stats, I think, uh, sum it up. Last year, they studied, there was a study published the, um, by the, uh, out of the British Medical Journal that cited over 250,000 U.S. citizens die annually as it relates to uh, medical error. And if this stunning number is, in fact, correct, it would make it the third leading cause of death 
behind cardiovascular and neurologic complications. And a truly, truly scary number. Also, consider the fact that estimates say that over $1 trillion U.S. dollars are wasted annually for uh, waste, uh, treatments that are not going according to plan. And to give you a sense of the size of that, $1 trillion is what the entire NHS spends to care for the population of the U.K. in a year. So huge, huge numbers with dramatic impact. So a fair question is, why is this happening? And what's the challenge? I think in the fact that uh, the tools that are being used out there are tools that served us very well for several decades. Uh, but today, the data we have, as was just uh, related to, it's much larger, orders of magnitude larger. It's much more complex and of many more types than it used to be. And it's located now in many silos, both on-premise and in the cloud. And the task of pulling this all together combining it and analyzing it is simply, uh, the, the overhead of it is just astounding. And that's why I have the image here of the incandescent bulb. Because similar to that, where of the energy put into it, only 10% turns into light, the end product that matters. Similarly, when you look at data science projects, only about 10% of the actual time is spent on data science. The other 90% is spent on data prep work. Pulling the data together, integrating it, cleansing it, and tuning and optimizing these older tools to make them somehow perform against these massive data sets that were never really built to take care of. So as a result, when you go and if you were to tour most hospitals, see where the data scientists are at, if you look over his or her shoulder, there's a 90% chance you see something like this. You see them in a spreadsheet cleaning up data, doing all this data prep work. And this is a real challenge, because not only is it inefficient, but as Ross alluded to, there's a huge shortage of, of talented data scientists. And so you have this, this bad combination of very few data science and very, very inefficient tools to work with. And so the result of it is that analytics and data science has really remained the purview of the board and really the highest level of organizational de uh, decisions. And the rest of us muddle through the best we can with the data we have, uh, despite having often worldviews that are not entirely correct, as, as was spoken to in the first combination. So the good news with this, though, is that we're not the first sector that's had this challenge. And other sectors with their information intensive have hit this wall in the past. And there are some tools there today that can uh, dramatically change it. SAP created HANA, in fact, for precisely this reason. It's an in-memory computing database where all data is kept in memory and it's analyzed uh, in parallel very, very rapidly by multiple cores. And so it allows both the dramatic acceleration of data analysis, but even more importantly, the dramatic simplification so that you can invert that ratio and now begin to spend far more of your energy actually on data science and value creation, insight creation, and far less on the data prep work. So what I want to talk to you about now uh, for my remaining time is uh, what we're doing uh, actually in terms of making a difference with this technology. At SAP Health, we built a platform with health-specific componentry on top of it. And where we started out several years ago was actually, fittingly, here locally in Berlin at Charité. Tackling one of the big challenges, and that's ever since the advent of the electronic health record, data is dutifully stored for every single patient. Almost every action on every patient is recorded. But the ability of clinicians, researchers, and administrators to actually use that data is incredibly limited because the only way you can get it is getting one of those all-too-rare data scientists or analysts and meeting with them over a series of weeks and months trying to get them to understand the data you want. So in essence, the cost of asking a question is so high that it's prohibitive and the questions, a lot of great questions, in fact, are never asked. So what we wanted to do was expose this information and make it so that clinicians could actually visually browse the data, to put a graphical user interface over the data and make the technology fall away, to really make interacting the data visual and to allow it to be able to uh, be browsed and in a more conversational fashion, to start out with a thesis ask questions of the data, see the results, and modify your thesis over time to come up with knowledge and insight. So just to give you a really quick sense of how it might look, in this particular setting, we have uh, uh, someone has selected a population of uh, patients with ovarian cancer and selected various demographic aspects of those patients. And then from there, once they have the population, they're able to uh, drill down and hop across from the clinical aspects and look at the genomic aspects. So this is what's called a circus diagram. It compares reference DNA with the DNA of patients. 
And there, the person notes that there's a spike you can see there in red that shows that there's a difference there from reference. Able then to drill all the way down to the actual base pair level, to the actual gene where this is occurring. So you have this mashup of clinical and genomic information and the ability of clinicians, researchers, and administrators to begin to browse and interact with this on their own. In, in essence, is really the democratization of access to data, the creation of information, insight, and, and hopefully wisdom. So this was really exciting, but we wanted to then take this and make it um, something that was actually going to drive decision making for patients at, at the patient by patient level in near real time. So we worked with folks at National Center for Tumor in Heidelberg, Germany, and really started to focus on the question of how can we take that wealth of information, that institutional knowledge, real world evidence of how previous patients had done before with the therapies actually being administered, and begin to uh, be, make smarter decisions based on that. So one of the big challenges, and this is some surprising to those who are not in the area, only about 5% of patients are enrolled in clinical trials. And that might be fine if those 5% of patients reflected the population at large. But in fact, in general, there are people like this woman who are otherwise healthy uh, aside from their cancer. But in the real world, patients look more like this. This is Jones. She's older, she's sicker. Patients are often more ethnically diverse and have many medical problems and challenges. And they don't really reflect the population that the study was done on. Now, why this is important, studies themselves are designed to isolate and, um, to what you're studying, to make sure that you can say with a high degree of certainty that the difference between treatments relates to the treatment itself and not other confounding uh, factors. So you make the patients as equivalent as you can on both sides, and you remove all compounding factors that you can. So what happens with that is that a, it's published in a premier journal, and it's done only on a particular segments of populations that are very, very specific. And then, of course, when Mrs. Jones walks through the door, she's someone who never would have qualified to be in the, patient, in the, in the trial in the first place. Mrs. Jones and patients like her, in fact, are not re represented at all in the trial. So what happens then is it's on to the clinician to set his or her sense of what patients like Mrs. Jones have done. And based on our recall bias and other patterns, we way over wait times when it, things have gone well for patients and want to reuse that again and again. And when it's gone particularly badly for a patient, we tend not to want to use that. So we're, we're full of biases. And, but uh, this is really the best we have, and this is how it's accomplished. So what we wanted to do was then move beyond and begin to actually leverage what had happened to patients historically like Mrs. Jones in the past. Now, to do this is non-trivial. That's why it hasn't been done before. In the real world, to get to the tumor marker, which drives the selection of the chemotherapeutic agent, you need to get the, the type of uh, mutation that's in place. That mutation lives either in a doctor's note or a pathology report. And those both are in unstructured format. So the first thing we have to do is dive into the free text, and we begin to need to do uh, natural language processing. And as we're reading through that data, we have to be smart enough if we encounter a note that says, uh, um, Mrs. Jones' mother was BRCA1 positive, however, patient tests negative today. We have to know that doesn't mean that she has BRCA1, right? So we have to do linguistic analysis on the natural language processing and then put it all together. Once we've isolated that tumor marker, then we go out to the rest of the patients who've been seen within the institution. We match based on the tumor marker, age, gender, ethnicity, as well as other confounding medical challenges and problems. And we come back with a very specific population that is very similar to Mrs. Jones. The key exception is they've all been treated and we know the result of the therapy. So we're able to generate what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve here, which compares survival over time. Typically, when you hear about five-year survivals in cancer, this is what they're talking about. It shows over a five-year course of time, survival comparing one therapy to the other. So now, all of a sudden, rather than having to rely on my imperfect pattern recognition capability of patients who seem somewhat similar to Mrs. Jones in the past, we're able to now use institutional wisdom, real-world evidence to actually drive a more precise precision medicine type of answer. And this is profound in terms of the implications. Now, we've moved from there to uh, working in addition with the American Society of Clinical Oncology in the U.S. on a project called CancerLink, which takes this basic concept and elevates it so that it now can work between institutions. So we're beginning to knit together 
uh, oncology practices and hospitals and integrate their real-world evidence across between them to allow this to occur at a higher level. And in less than two years, we have over two million patients accrued in the system, and the growth is only accelerating over time. And finally now, we're moving on uh, to work also with um, the Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris and continuing the work forward. So what does this all mean? Uh, you know, this is, I'm, I'm sharing a journey uh, underway. I don't have the final chapter yet, but I think where we're, where we're headed with this is really uh, the ability and a really a, a strong pivot in healthcare. So if there is data out there that can materially improve a decision, whether it be clinical, uh, research-based, or administrative, that we begin to bring data to bear to make that decision intelligently, that we begin to leverage institutional knowledge broadly at an enterprise level to drive better decision making. So I thank you for your time and attention. We've been taking the, uh, the data-centric view in the first several uh, uh, talks, and now I think is the opportunity to flip it around and start to come from the view of the, the patient uh, within a health system. And so our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Francesca Colombo. Thank you. I'm going to take a slightly uh, more systemic uh, view, and I will talk about three main uh, things. One, what are the opportunities and the challenges of using uh, big data for uh, you know, health systems more broadly? Secondly, where do countries stand, looking particularly at the OECD, so the more higher uh, income countries? And third, what needs uh, to be uh, done uh, to take advantage of the opportunities uh, uh, while addressing the challenges? So it's... So first, in terms of the main opportunities, um, they, they were alluded to in the, in the presentation that we heard um, up to now, but I would like to categorize them in three main, in four main categories. Uh, when we're talking about big data, they range huge opportunities for healthcare system performance in four main respects. The first is about clinical practice improvements. So it has to do really with faster access to critical information for clinical decision making. It has to do also with the possibility to coordinate uh, care across setting in a, um, in a more easy way. And there are some examples, um, for lack of time, I'm not going uh, into the specific example. But there is that particular you know, clinical improvements uh, um, component. Secondly, is the system management that was also alluded to. The ability to get rid of waste, which is quite high in health system. The ability to monitor and improve the technical and allocative efficiency, but also the possibility to monitor quality of care. And there are a number of uh, uh, countries that have moved in that uh, direction of using big data. There is then the issues of surveillance. Think about, uh, for example, the uh, preparedness, uh, you know, public health emergency preparedness, um, the monitoring also of the uh, effectiveness uh, of new technologies and medical devices. That's a third uh, possible application of big data. And lastly, there is the possibility of using big data for research and innovation. Uh, think about uh, the issues of statistical power that big data can, uh, can bring about. Things that the vast, varied, uh, data sets that, that we have, also the possibility of uh, doing better real-world sampling that was alluded to. So these are just some of the uh, examples. Clearly, there are a number of challenges, and the challenges are what uh, are very often heard uh, in the news. Just put some uh, examples here from two countries, the UK and, De and Denmark, which actually are among the most advanced uh, internationally in terms of really reconciling uh, the issues of use of data with some of the possible uh, challenges with that. And the challenges come from the fact that big data or data, they're personal and they are sensitive. And because of that, there is a risk that they might be used in an appropriate way, a uh, way they might uh, fall in the wrong hands and therefore have implications for discrimination and empl uh, employment also of individuals. They might uh, have uh, implications in terms of reducing the public trusts, 
uh, also think about the cyber attacks, which are very much uh, up in the hair. So there are a number of possible risks that exist out there. And some of the countries like Denmark and the UK, they actually have been quite the most advanced in trying really to have uh, a system, a governance that allows using of data while uh, taking uh, into consideration the possible challenges have fallen under <coughs> considered scrutiny and criticism uh, because of uh, not really getting it right or struggling to get it right. So the first message that I have is that there is a real challenge to mm, uh, be able to reconcile these uses of data uh, in a way which uh, obviously is privacy respectful and address some of the possible challenges. So where do countries stand? Um, when I say when countries stand, I'm particularly referring to their use of uh, big data for some of the four uh, main opportunities which are highlighted in my first slide. And there are two main things which need to be taken into consideration when looking at this picture. First, are countries able to link data sets? And second, how they're able to use the uh, data which are included in uh, electronic medical records. So in terms of uh, linking uh, data sets, and so the uh, advantage, I mean, is quite known. You have a huge amount of data in a uh, in health system poorly used and very often not linked. And only by linking those different data sets, you can have all of those four uh, advantages which I alluded to. So this slide is a little bit complicated to, uh, to, to read, but let me walk you. It's uh, in, in uh, green, you have the, niche, the, the national data sets uh, which are available in, uh, in countries. And the numbers which are here from zero to 25 is the number of countries. So it shows how many countries have national data sets in all those areas, clinical or uh, health areas, uh, which are included in, in the left. So from hospital to population health survey data, disease registries and so forth. So different data sets. So the, quite a number of countries have national uh, data sets in, uh, in green that, that you can see, although there are fewer for when we talk to, uh, about disease registries and patient reported outcomes. But the number of countries uh, gets lower when we look at those countries that have unique ID included and used consistently across the data sets. And it dramatically uh, reduces when we look at the ability of uh, uh, the countries to link regularly those data sets to monitor quality and system performance. So the highest linkages occur really in the three top data sets, hospital, cancer registries, and mortality data. But they really, really drop dramatically when we look at the other data sets. So can this really be considered as big data? A number of countries have a lot uh, really to, uh, to go through in order to be able to make, um, to take opportunities or the advantage of big data. Another way to look at this is to look at electronic medical records. Electronic medical records have uh, tremendous opportunities that can inform a wide range of uh, uh, statistical and policy and research activities, not just help the clinical decision making. And we have uh, looked and mapped countries against two um, indicators. They are actually index which have been constructed. One is the technical and operational readiness that countries have. So things such as do they have completeness and coverage and data quality and usability of the data uh, containing the uh, electronic medical records. And um, on the y-axis, we have looked at their data governance. So do, do they have a, a legal framework? Do they have the right policy and communications to make use of the, this data? We, ha we see on the uh, top right corner a number of countries, particularly in the Nordic, uh, but also in the, some of the um, Anglo countries, which have good readiness, technical and governance. But we see also a number of countries that either don't have the governance or do not have the technical readiness. So it means that we have all those data, they're there, but they're not really uh, leverage for some of the um, uh, public health purposes which are alluded to in my uh, first slide. So what are the limitations in data? There are a number, in lack of time, I'm not going uh, very much in depth into those, but they, they go from uh, no regular linkages, as I, I mentioned, but also lengthy processes, for example, to negotiate data sharing arrangements uh, between level, different level of governments or between different parts of the systems, or the fact that the identified national data are not accessible for academic purposes, um, or they're not accessible to foreign applications, or even to private, section, private sector, question mark, obviously, for data uh, for public health uses. Should they be uh, uh, available to pub private sector for uh, public health uses? So there are a number of uh, data limitations that we find in countries. And to get to my uh, last point of my presentations, 
um, we think that it's possible, it's very doable, to uh, allow um, good use of data for the four um, you know, good purposes I alluded to in my first slides, while minimizing uh, the risk or taking into consideration the risk and the challenges and notably the risk to uh, privacy. But that requires not just one legislation, it requires really an overarching data governance. And the data governance includes both legal aspects, um, things uh, such as shown in, in these slides uh, about uh, the, the way the data uh, can be processed, uh, the uh, consensus, or in, the, uh, in, in some cases, exemption to consensus, for example. But it has to do also with communication. The examples of the UK and, and Denmark was really an issue about how the users of data and the advantage of the users of data were communicated and also how the individual's concern was informed about how their own data were being used and the advantages of, uh, of those uses. And it has to do with technical uh, issues. For example, having state-of-the-heart um, uh, systems for safeguards of those uh, processing uh, the data and so forth. So at the OECD, we have worked with countries to come up with this set of principles that are much more uh, elaborated, which have been actually adopted by ministers in January uh, 2000 and 17, and countries will be monitored against their progress in uh, uh, compiling or uh, moving towards this set of principles. It's not just, as I mentioned, an issue of the legal framework. It has to do with the broader uh, um, you know, aspects about technical and communication uh, issues uh, as well. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. So I think one of the uh, points we'll address later is um, it's very daunting. There's, uh, there's uh, individual projects within a hospital system, the systemic projects across a, 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 health, uh, a, health, a national health system. And if you're interested in starting to use big data, how do you start? Where do you start? At what level? Does the government need to get it right? Do you start something individually and locally about specific aspects of health? We'll, we'll look at that. Finally, on to our, our last speaker, Albina Kuyumjeva, who <laughs> is going to uh, is round out the initial presentations and then we'll move into panel discussion and questions. Good morning, everyone. It's always the pleasure of the lawyer in the panel to round up the discussion. So today I want to focus your attention on ethics oversight, a process that I'm sure as uh, individual researchers you like a lot. So benefits of big data. Francesca already mentioned some of them. They're the potential of big data analysis for improving our lifestyles, for improving the quality of healthcare, for, for improving our life in general are undeniable. Yet, as very often happens, the technical, technological development precedes the ethics, the social, cultural, and even legal changes in the society and the way we perceive our life and the way we want to see our future. So along with big data come a lot of ethics challenges. And while we can discuss many different categories, they can be genuinely linked in six main groups. Concerns regarding privacy, concerns regarding informed consent, ownership, who owns the data, objectivity, to what extent the data that we are using to analyze our life and to propose solutions for the future is actually objective and reflects the reality. And already some of the speakers mentioned uh, this problem. The big data divide, and finally group uh, level ethics harms. Privacy is obviously the most evident ethics concern along with the informed consent. What has happened, and we slowly see how the idea of concepts of being in public and being public in offline life and in online life, they kind of um, have a different perspective. If I go to the hospital and I share with my f 
fellow patient waiting in front of the doctor's room, what are my symptoms and what are my concerns, we are in a public space. Yet, our conversation remains private and it does not belong to the hospital. If we go to social media or different online tools and platforms for health discussions, all of a sudden we have scientists saying, well, this is a data that is available public. So just because we can scrap it, we can use it. And this is a big problem that we still have to solve. How to make sure that we don't have a huge groups and numbers of unwilling participants in our research studies, how to make sure that they actually have provided their informed consent because we don't have major problems when we collect, when we have the informed consent for current big data analysis and researches, but what do we do with data that have been already previously collected or what do we do with data that we take from so-called data brokers? How do we reconcile the ultimate obligation of the researcher to, to, to explain and make the research participants aware on what is done with their data with the blank sometimes informed consent on, on social media or different online platforms or uh, different applications. And then going back to the concept of ownership, who owns the data? From a legal perspective, it's a quite tricky subject. Who owns the data is different. We have the concept of who controls the data and he, who uses the data. And then we have a big big data, potential big data divide between the people who provide the data and the organizations who utilize the data, analyze the data, reap the benefits of the data and provide solutions. Are the benefits shared with the data provider? Anonymi anonymization of big data sets is usually given as the ultimate solution. We anonym anonymize data and then everything is fine. Yes and no, because first we very much know that data, combining different data sets, even of anonymized data, with different identifiers can actually lead to the uh, re-identification of the, of the individual person. But even if we go outside of this concept and if we think of big data analysis and results, we, we go from the uh, concept that we protect the individual, the privacy of the individual, to a concept that actually, even if the privacy of this individual that provided the data is not harmed, a big data analysis can provide conclusions that can lead to group level ethics harms. So individuals from a group can be stigmatized an entire group of population can be stigmatized based on cultural, economic, religious, or whatever racial context without the participants from, many of the participants from this group even taken, uh, being taken part of in, in our research. So all these are ethical issues that we have to consider as researchers when we do our analysis. What we do in the European Commission to reflect on, on all these issues. Horizon 2020, for all of you that may not have heard of it, is the biggest research and innovation program with uh, funding of 80 billion until 2020. In order to ensure ethics compliance, we have made the compliance part of the contractual obligation and it's actually a funding requirement. We have constructed a process that promotes the and tries to uh, bring the awareness of the researchers at the highest level and at the same time to check ex ante and expose the compliance with the ethical standards and the legal framework that has been established. The process therefore consists of different tires and the first and the most important tires is of course the ethics self-assessment that each of the applicants in Horizon 2020 has to do. They have to answer of, uh, uh, a table with a 
list of different questions. One of the very important categories, apart from the research with humans and animals, of course, is data protection. And there we try to raise the awareness of the applicant at this very first level and make sure that the application is ethics ready, that all these ethics challenges that I have briefly mentioned in the previous slide have been taken into consideration. And then after the ethics self-assessment, we have a re ethics review process. This is the sector where I work, which tries to ensure that all the possible harms are mitigated and the risks uh, from an ethics perspective are mitigated in all the projects that we are funding. And then we have a process of ethics screening and ethics pre-screening done by independent experts, which main job is to ensure that the applicant is aware and to help also the applicant and the future beneficiary comply and face in a proper way the ethics challenges that I already mentioned. And this is the ex ante oversight. Once a project is funded, we have an ex post evaluation, which is the so-called ethics check, where a panel of independent experts is again looking at how the requirements, the ethics requirements, which are part of the contractual obligations, have been fulfilled. And the idea through the entire process is to help and support the researchers. The idea is not to ensure to, I'm finished. The idea is not to make the process burdensome, but to provide utmost help and ensure ethics compliance. The major, uh, the major ethics challenges in this overall process where we rely also uh, a lot on the national ethics committees and the national bioethics committees in particular when we are talking about medical research is the lack of, we were talking, the previous speakers were talking about the lack of uh, data scientists. Here at the level of ethic oversight, we have to rely on the ethics committee which sometimes may need the technical knowledge or understanding how the different processes of merging data and data processing can lead to potential ethics issues or not. Also, from the side of individual researchers, sometimes we still have a very weak comprehension on the possible negative impacts of big data research. We are lacking comprehensive guidelines and when we talk about ethics oversight, our main aim, as I said, is not to create a new bureaucracy, not to stop big data analysis because we have an ethics concerns, but to help to avoid the whiplash effect, but to help the researchers be ethics compliant because at the end of the day, ethics is the key of making science great. Thank you very much. very much. So we are going to finish uh, uh, bang on time at 10.30. So we have just a limited amount of time for um, uh, a bit of panel discussion and shortly I'll be looking for questions from the audience. So, so look, I think um, perhaps we could start with this issue. There's a general belief that big data is going to be good, but you're a hospital CEO or and you think, I'd like to use big data. What do you do at the moment? It seems incredibly fragmented. There's things occurring at national level, there's research projects, there's SAP. Is it too early? Or are there ways to enter in? Perhaps uh, David and Maxime might want to start addressing this issue and then we'll expand it out. Sure, I think that, actually, I think that, um, you know, it's actually late probably to get started. Um, you know, the the value that can be unlocked in, in really healthcare doing what other sectors have done, and that's began to run as data-driven enterprises, mission-based ones for sure, but, but really understanding the delivery of care. Um, you know, there's a saying when you graduate medical school, 50% of what you learned is wrong, and the challenge is you don't know which 50%, right? And, and you spend your career out practicing, um, you know, getting very, very limited feedback in terms of um, the impact and how you're doing well and where you need to do better. So 
Closing that loop, allowing feedback, and allowing enterprises to shift to become uh, learning entities is just fundamental. It's something that we all, um, as providers and patients of these systems, uh, you know, need desperately. Maxine, do you want to make a? Uh, well, I think, uh, well, there is already a number of uh, technologies one can use uh, just uh, out of the shelf. Uh, as I mentioned, well, in, in different sectors, uh, there are already uh, uh, big data tools that can be used in uh, healthcare with minimum uh, uh, tuning. So uh, the matter is the education, but uh, my brother is a, a physiologist and I had been uh, uh, helping him for quite a while with statistics, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I saw how, for instance, well, the statistics uh, uh, in medical journals uh, has been improved. Well, the same will happen with uh, big data, I believe. So I think there is a, a clear challenge to how to encourage and allow experimentation uh, in a field in which obviously innovation uh, is particularly important, with avoid getting all over the place. I mean, paradoxically, some of the countries that have been uh, leading ahead in the issues of, inter inter on, of uh, data and using big data, they have uh, systems which are not interoperable. And now they struggle more to, you know, get the more overarching system level picture because things have gone a little bit their own way. So that's where obviously having uh, some directions and the clear national even level policies about, uh, you know, which, which try to uh, make sure that there's a channeling of all these innovations in a way which uh, ultimately is conducive to, to public good that's, uh, and that makes things easier for those in the system. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, it's fundamental. I mean, there are some countries, even some of the small countries, I think Estonia is really doing wonderful thing in the big data space, but they started from perhaps a, a lower level than, than other countries, but uh, you know, they, they start in a way that uh, allows uh, leveraging the, the opportunities at system level. Um, we haven't mentioned it before, but I think the provision of digital health infrastructure is what can also support and help the current uh, diversion of resources and, and, and the problems of sharing actually da data in a way that ensures the privacy uh, of the individual. So the provision, the new uh, digital single, single market strategy of the union aims at providing such uh, digital health infrastructure as a part of also the open science cloud and to ensure that all the data is shared among the different countries in a way that is beneficial for the entire society. Uh, yeah, just a quick reflection. Um, the, like Sweden, where I live, and European Union, OECD countries, we've seen logotypes for these kind of country clubs, which are all Western. Uh, I grew up in Africa, and I work a lot with Africa. Uh, there is a chance that uh, those emerging economies, like South Africa, for example, uh, get ahead of us because they don't have such rigid systems. So they could actually be more creative as a government, a government to, to do things the right way to start with. Like you mentioned, Estonia being uh, behind might be a benefit in this situation. With, with collection of survey data uh, in the statistic agency, there is a clear sign that South Africa, for example, could adopt the iPad collection of data way faster than Sweden ever could. So after going to courses in Stockholm to learn how to collect statistics, suddenly the Swedes need to go to South Africa to actually, how do you do it, you know, because they actually could implement that reform way faster with the economic constraints. If there is a benefit in big data, they will be much faster to do it than we will. So, so perhaps to synthesize, if the national structures are right, it's, it facilitates it occurring within local, uh, local hospitals, local primary healthcare networks. And if you don't have that uh, national approach, you, you should still try and do it, but it's going to be a, a hell of a lot harder than, than it is if you've got uh, recognised uh, processes with which to work with. So perhaps I could ask the panel uh, very, very briefly, nominate the, either the healthcare in, uh, entity that you think is an example of best practice or the, or the country that's got it right. In, in paving the way for big data. Just quickly across the panel, nominate for people in the audience who they should go and look at to see where they think things have really worked well. well 
Well, I would nominate Russia, and uh, because well, uh, from one side, well, we have uh, uh, good medical uh, hospitals all around the country. Uh, from another side, well, the regulations are much softer than uh, in the states or uh, in Europe. So, well, there is, there is a number of large-scale uh, projects on big data that uh, are quite successful. And uh, just uh, uh, to finish, well, one approach to overcome these barriers with zero relations is to use uh, uh, a new idea. Well, it's not that new. Uh, uh, instead of data go, uh, go to algorithms, algorithms go to data. Well, there is a number of new uh, IT technologies like containers where you don't need to download the data or you don't need to collect the data. You rather distribute the algorithms uh, that will give you well, uh, uh, the outcomes with, without breaching the uh, privacy or, or other uh, regulations. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure that I would um, single out any country right now having it all right. I, I think there's aspects in, in or various institution. or institution. Or yeah, or I, I would say, you, you know, I would give three main criteria that I would look for that I don't think anyone fulfills uh, fully today. Uh, having a national patient identifier is, is absolutely crucial. Those that don't have it suffer mightily. Um, having the, um, the interoperability rules and regulations in place to foster data exchange. And the third is uh, a payment system that, that encourages competition around outcomes and, and really uniting the party and it really encourages and, and really mandates the, the competition and the use of data to drive improved outcomes. Those three factors together, I think, are the magic sauce. Well, I showed a little bit in one slide some of the countries which seem to be more uh, advanced uh, are some of the Nordic and some of the Anglophones, including England, but they all have uh, been also the ones that have been under more pressure precisely because as soon as there is a use of data, perhaps information which is not communicated in the right way, then the things goes into the news. So it's about certainly some of the Nordic data and uh, the, the UK, I think New Zealand has done also some, uh, some wonderful uh, things. So um, on the other hand, there are uh, quite advanced uh, economies which are stuck, stuck really not using data, mainly because they, they lack this governance framework and the legal um, uh, you know, infrastructure is really quite restrictive because of a fear of uh, inappropriate use of data. And sometimes this fear of inappropriate use of data may go you know, to the way of not really uh, getting the benefits uh, right. So I agree with what you say, those are uh, crucial elements, but you know, the communication aspects and some, uh, you know, are really also quite fundamental uh, to get it right. Yeah. Right, thank you. I'll just uh, be very brief. Uh, I'll give you an example of a very good, good practice at the European level, and this is the European Human Biomonitoring Initiative, which where uh, member states people from different member states are sharing biomonitoring data through information platform for chemical monitoring. And I think it's worth visiting. Okay, thank you very much. So, are there questions from the uh, audience, people who would like to, uh, I see one over there. Uh, my name is Paolo Villerin from uh, Sapienza Not University not of Rome. Not, I, I wanted to say not, that I'm very grateful, not, Mr. Chairman, not, to the panelists, not, because not, before not, this session, big data not, for me not, and I think not, for many other people not, was a big mystery in the sense not, that not, we don't know how big not, they are, where they are, how is it possible not, to get this not, and something like that. Uh, after not, this session, not, I think not, that things are, not, are more clearer to me, particularly not, I'm very grateful not, to Francesca not, Colombo not, because not, uh, uh, her presentation not, was very clear. And not, I agree not, that one not, of the main problems in Italy not, as well as not, in other countries not, is that uh, the health information systems not, are not linked, so not, they, not, they do not, not talk not, with, with not, each other, and this is not, a big not, a problem. But, however, not, uh, my uh, specific comment, uh, specific answer <coughs> concerns the main limitations not, of big data, not, because not, big data has a big potential, it's uh, sure, absolutely sure, 
but uh, I think uh, that uh, one uh, of the main barriers uh, to, to the use uh, of big data is uh, for sure uh, the ethical problems, but I think uh, that there are also uh, technical problems in the sense uh, that uh, we need very good studio uh, design inside uh, the big data uh, in order to analyze uh, the big data. Because uh, I think uh, that the, the, the most important risk is to think uh, that uh, the an analysis uh, of big data uh, that gave always, give always very good uh, results. This is not uh, absolutely true. We need a sort uh, of epidemiological thinking in design, uh, the study design, able uh, to use uh, the big data. Mm. Yes, perhaps just to respond on behalf of the panel, I think all of us agree that just because you've got a lot of data, if it's poor quality, it's useless. And uh, often, Big data must be harnessed to a specific question and often you need to go in very, very uh, uh, specific in order to actually have an actionable uh, process that you can implement to improve health along the way. But all of statistics, type 1 errors, type 2 errors, it's all there. Big data hasn't made that go away. I think we had a question. Uh, My name is Brigitte Bühlen. I'm the chairperson of a caregiver's organization. Um, my question, how can you get society into the boat? There are two sides of a medal. On the one side, there are experts, scientists. There's a very uh, a meta level. But on the other side, you have the people, you have the societies. How can you get an interface between those two groups? Uh, and uh, or is the future the uh, first? Perhaps you think uh, we make our um, things, <laughs> and uh, uh, people will not react, or perhaps they uh, sleep, and uh, we will get no um, response of them. But. Uh, I think um, there should be a strategy, strategy uh, you shouldn't let the train go. Okay, perhaps uh, Ola and then... No, here it is. Uh, I'll combine the answer with the answer to the previous question, an a good example. Uh, I don't know the details, but the National uh, Center uh, Cancer Center in the US, the Biden Initiative, uh, I heard about it some week ago, and, and it, was, it seems to be a very innovative way to combine data sets from multiple databases. It starts with the, the general U.S. way to attract the public to say, we got a moonshot, we're going we're gonna to treat cancer, okay? We're going we're gonna to find the, prob uh, the, the solution to this problem. And that's why we do this, okay? So the, the, the public is on board. They like the idea because you have this bold political statement starting with it. And then they started acting very practically by collecting everybody who, who uh, were involved in some way or another. And, and this is the key thing uh, he told me, the head of the institute, that they sat down in a room and asked everybody, what is your contact with the patient? When are you meeting the patient uh, physically? When is that happening? And what are you recording? And where are these recordings? Can we uh, gather all those different data sets into one place with a, uh, with a bunch of, of uh, technically skilled people who get access to all these databases in the name of this bold mission? And, and suddenly the military started uh, realizing that, well, we got this huge database of blood samples, which nobody have ever tested. Uh, run any analysis across. So they started gathering these kind of databases and, and just the matchmaking between the people who are engaged with the problem and technically skilled and the actual access to experts who know these databases. I would say that's a very good starting point if you have technical people on board that the main challenge, as you mentioned, getting the tec technically advanced uh, developers to sit there. But when they are in the room, putting them in contact with real data and the people who know that data and trying to, to have them uh, start scraping it and, and uh, cr crunching it as, as practically as possible, as soon as possible, then suddenly insights usually pop up quite fast. Right. But, but if I understand the question, it was about balancing the private and the personal against the collective and the public, and I think perhaps... Uh... I think it's, it's all related to trust. And currently what we see is that people tend to trust 
uh, research organizations more than commercial organizations. So we have this divide when people say, yes, I would love to give my data for research purposes to research institutes, but I'm not that willing to give it for commercial purposes. Whether this is uh, wrong or uh, good, I'm, I'm not commenting, but the more trust and the more we explained as a researcher, as a research community, on where we want to go and why we want to go there and involve people like citizen science. This is for me the way we should, we should, we can build trust and get the society on board. Make every citizen scientist and get involved in bringing the bigger benefit for the society as such. And this is where the privacy concerns get less and less and the bigger benefit of the society gets more important. Right, I think we have time for just two brief questions. There's one up the back and one down the front, as briefly as you can, thanks. Thank you very much. My name is Stefan German, Fondation Botnar. My question is to uh, the, from the Chief Medical Officer from the SAP. I think the three factors which you mentioned are, are, I think, very much spot on in terms of sort of the magic formula. And you mentioned clearly the innovative financing related to sort of moving incentives to results, outcome space. Could you give some very practical example that you're aware of that that is actually being done linked to digital and digital sort of health outcomes, uh, innovative payment systems? Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, my, my view is going to be a little U.S.-centric on this, um, but, but the location, uh, you know, where they're truly tying payment to outcomes, and not just in a gain-sharing fashion, but in a truly at-risk fashion, is, is creating a, a, an entirely new focus on uh, really looking at healthcare as a value chain, a value creation, and really measuring the endpoints that the patient and the people funding the care care about. It doesn't matter if a surgery was a success, but the patient expires two months later or, or you know, has outcomes after that. It's really you have to measure and, and reward for those outcomes. And um, you know, getting into the data is, is hugely important because pretty much everywhere, uh, you know, data, some people talk about it as currency, but it's a raw material. And data, particularly data that isn't used and mined, uh, tends to be very rough and, and a bit ugly underneath it. And, and so part of the process is getting underway is getting into the data, and that gives you visibility into where the data isn't what it needs to be, and then you can begin to create data governance to, to begin to improve the data over time. So just getting started, beginning using it is, is uh, incredibly important. And is there an example at the moment in the US where you think that either in the HMOs or s some of those others that are really just focusing on outcome and linking payment to that? Yeah, you know, some of the, uh, the Medicare programs uh, that are beginning to reward specifically for outcomes in, in areas like uh, orthopedics and, and others, um, the amount of cost takeout that can occur uh, along with an improvement in quality, which is, is magical. You think about it, you can pay less and get better quality when you start managing the process tightly. So Medicare and a lot of the private payers are, I think, doing some very exciting work. Great, thank you. And very briefly, the last question down the front. Perhaps turn to the... Okay. scales in the world, and we realize that many countries, including the United States, United Kingdom, have, have fa significant facilities and infrastructure, and yet the wisdom to use the data in the real decision making to the better efficiency of the healthcare system is not there. So what is the panel's view to reach that wisdom and use these experiences, specifically in the context of low middle income countries? One part is infrastructure, but the more important one is the mentality of the policymakers over there to use and, and to look at this as not the kind of luxury, as an only way to survive and have the sustainability of the financial resources in order to use the resources for the benefit of the public, given the limited and constraining uh, financial resources there. So how we can somehow how coined this in, the, in, in terms of the way of the efficiency of the policy making for the health system in a way which sustains the use of this big, the big data and reach the wisdom. Thank we you. We have one minute in total for the panel to answer that. Who wants to take it? So, of course, I mean, a, a lot of the uh, slowness has been due to the issues that we discussed, a lot of the data governance. So, once you have a data governance that allows the use of data, you already 
gone a step far farther. But I think from that there will be another next step uh, to go, which is really thinking how do we leverage then data for uh, really transformations of delivery systems. And we know that the health delivery systems are very, very rigid. So that is going to be probably the next challenge. From a policymaker's perspective, you're stuck with workforce models which are very rigid, um, hospital-centric systems, and I'm talking obviously more about the, the more advanced economies. So we have created a system which is incredibly rigid and which contrasts with all the opportunities offered by, uh, by uh, big data for much more localized, patient-centered view of health systems. So that will be the next challenge at a system level. Um, that comes once uh, countries have addressed the data governance issue, which obviously, if you don't have it, then you cannot even think about the system transformation. So I think we're going to have to uh, stop it there. I'd like to uh, thank the panel for their contribution today. It was very wide ranging from uh, system level down to individual. I must admit I came into this uh, session thinking that big data was just small data with delusions of grandeur, but I've now decided that, in fact, uh, there is something in big data, but the challenges to implementation uh, will be extraordinary and it will need a partnership of the research institutions, the uh, public sector, uh, the, uh, the not-for-profits, government, to really introduce this, and I think we have in front of us the work of decades. So if you could uh, join me in thanking the panel. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance.